Hello everyone, reporting today for First Updates Now, I'm Abhas, and with me here is Team 19066 AI citizens from Romania. They are currently ranked number one by OPR in the world. They were the winning alliance captain at the Romania National Championships and just have one of the fastest robots I've seen this season. I can't wait to jump into this and everything that's going on coming up on Behind the Bot. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Discover how Kettering University students engineered their success with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs where students earn great pay and gain valuable experience. Those accepted into Kettering University can apply for a robotic scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to kettering.edu slash first to learn more and apply. Support funds content creators when you sign up for a membership on YouTube Join. You'll get access to special perks like emotes, loyalty badges, and fund members will even get early access to our scheduled videos and more. 100% of this revenue will go back to our correspondents to help recognize their efforts. Click the join button in any YouTube video to pledge your support. Okay guys, so the first question I have for you is, I know Romania is one of the toughest regions to advance out of, right? And so coming into the season, you have to have a very strong plan. What was your approach to the game in general this season when you were looking at building a robot? Uh, well, basically from the start of the, se the season, we wanted to do an extend robot uh, because um, from the stage door to the uh, wing, there's like uh, one meter, eight centimeters. Mm -hmm. So uh, we just uh, used an extendo and uh, we saved that uh, for like 1.5 seconds on each cycle. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, no, that, that makes a ton of sense. And now jumping into the robot itself for the drivetrain, I mean, you know, we've seen a lot of different drivetrains come out of Romania, six wheel drive, Swerve, Mechanum, you guys have gone with the Mechanum drive. Is there anything special you'd like to highlight that you think really makes it, that really impacts your driving ability? Uh, well, one of the mo uh, most important things on our uh, uh, chassis is that uh, we use uh, field centric. Okay. And uh, it basically helped us a lot in uh, <laughs> teleop. And I want to state the fact that another big thing is the fact that it's so slim. Mm -hmm. Driving through the trusses made it way easier uh, because just because we are like 32 centimeters side to side. And this way we don't spend any more time aligning. Yeah, no, that, that makes a ton of sense. So now going into your intake, why don't you first walk me through it and then we'll jump into some more questions. Sure. So basically we are using uh, the op-flop design that you can find on Discord. We adapted it to our uh, intake. This is TPU rollers with folding intake, everything is belted to one motor in the back. And here is the bucket that has the shape of two pixels side by side. And this way, once one pixel, uh, one pixel enters, the other is guided by the first one into the second slot. <laughs> and of course, being mounted on the extendal, it can sag. So we have the two omni-directional wheels here. We were helped actually by a team to solve this. Yeah, and so now with your intake, do you guys have a bottom roller, like a counter roller, or you just decided you didn't need it? So we just used a ram. Uh -huh. It's not the best uh, approach to it, but it works uh, just fine. I see, yeah. And uh, as far as iterations go, what changes do you think you would say you made to your intake this season that just really made it so much smoother? I think, I think one of the biggest changes that we made was uh, adding the folding intake after the, the league meet. Mm -hmm. And uh, to be honest, it helped us a lot, not only by giving us uh, 12, more, reach. 12 more centimeters of extension, but also helping take us from the uh, take pixels from the stacks. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Now, talking a little bit about the software behind the intake, I think I saw a couple color sensors uh, in your hood. What other sensors are you using for your intake and how do you use them? So specifically for the intake, we use, uh, first of all, the current sensor in the, mo uh, in the mm -hmm. hub to relocalize the extension. The motor is actually here. And after that, we use the encoder on the extendo. Mm -hmm. And in the end, we use the two color sensors yeah, to detect the pixels inside so we can automate everything. We actually have everything automated. Awesome. Yeah, that, that makes a ton of sense. Now, going on to your transfer mechanism, how does your transfer work? And then again, we'll jump into some of the iterations you went through. Sure. So our transfer opens the bucket from the top with the pivoting roof. And then the claw can come straight from the top. Mm -hmm. You take the, uh, take the pixels and it can go into depot mode. Mm -hmm. And after that, it closes up. And so one thing I noticed with your uh, roof, as you said, so you actually have the servo pivoting around uh, yeah. the shaft itself instead of the servo being static. Was yeah. that just a design choice or was there something more behind that? 
Uh, at first, it looked like the best way to package the system because mm -hmm. we wanted to leave room here for the cables, and it actually proved to work. Yeah, awesome. That that makes a ton of sense. So now, uh, as far as automation goes and sensors go for your transfer, what uh, sensing do you have there, or really was it just so consistent you didn't need anything? Uh, besides just the command-based system with time-based transfer, there's not much else. Okay, and do you guys have any sort of feedback to the driver that, okay, yes, we've intaken the pixels, or yes, we've transferred something like that, or just hours and hours of practice means you don't need that sort of feedback? Well, um, due to the two car sensors and uh, having only one driver, uh, when the two pixels are detected, the extensions automatically retract, mm -hmm. and the uh, it gets ready for the next command. Mm -hmm. So that's enough feedback as yeah. it is. Yeah. So when the intake stops, the driver knows when to go and transfer. Yeah, makes sense. So now talking about your deposit, walk us through all the degrees of freedom and then, yeah, we'll jump into some of the more specifics. So first of all, it's a polycarbonate arm mounted on a 60 degree lift. And then at the end of the effector, we have a pivot normally to be able to align to the backdrop. The wrist that helps us uh, mosaics better and then the claw, which can drop a single pixel at a time. Mm -hmm. And so has this been your arm the entire season or were there some iterations you made uh, to it throughout this map, throughout this, center stage? This is actually the fourth uh, claw we have. This okay. is the claw that we use at Nationals. Okay. It didn't have a wrist and also it didn't have the ability to drop uh, one pixel at a time. So at Nationals, we were forced to drop both pixels horizontally. Mm -hmm. And coming to Worlds, we saw the need to make mosaics easier, better, and have more precision on the, on the backdrop. That's why we added the wrist yeah. and the single drop. And so from a software perspective, how do you control all these degrees of freedom uh, in your autonomous and in your teleop programs? Uh, we don't actually use universe kinematics. We just use uh, normal set positions and the command-based system itself. I see. And talking also about your autonomous, you know, you guys are so, so fast. I think like two plus four, two plus six, easily I see you guys do. Uh, what do you use for your pathing in autonomous? And then also we can talk about other sensors. Yeah, so we use a version of uh, Pure Pursuit. It's a custom implementation. It's actually mostly uh, an unprofiled Bezier follower. Okay. Awesome, yeah. And so, you know, if teams have questions about that, are, is your code public or can they ask you more questions about it or...? Uh, yeah, they can follow up with questions on Discord. It's mm -hmm. not public yet. Uh, we want to just make it ready for balance before yeah. we open source it. Yeah, no, that makes a ton of sense. So now, talking about your endgame, you know, it's just as consistent as the rest of your guys' robot. Uh, as far as the drone is concerned, how does it work? Do you guys have any, like, fancy sensors in it or is it just, like, you know, just a lot of practice? Well, uh, with the drone, it's basically just the most simple paper airplane uh, you can do. And the... Uh, it's uh, acted by uh, two, uh, one servo that holds these two rubber bands, uh, and uh, it's the uh, Blue Bot Builders uh, yeah. paper drone, uh, uh, drone throw, drone launcher, but uh, slightly modified by us to fit our needs. Nice, yeah. And so talking about your hang, I see you guys have the hooks on your slides. Uh, from like a weight perspective, did you have to gear your slides differently because you were planning on hanging from them or no? Yeah, we did. Uh, we actually, first of all, calculated using recalc, but the problem was we underestimated the weight of the robot <laughs> by about two kilograms. Okay. And that proved to be bad because we actually couldn't climb at first. And then we went from 1150s to 435s. So that was what we used, the regionals and nationals. Mm -hmm. And because it was kind of slow, we actually just uh, changed the spools to be 1.5 times uh, larger. Nice. So in total, we used two 435 RPM motors mm -hmm. with a 32 millimeter spool. Awesome, yeah. And so again, with the hang, do you guys have any automations or is it just really all manual? We do have automations. Uh, so first of all, uh, both the drone launcher and hang actually open up after 90 seconds okay. into the Tilio because we wanted to um, prevent things from happening. <laughs> Our driver knows what happened. <laughs> and uh, so once uh, it's unlocked, we press the button, it goes straight to the climb, I press another, uh, the button again, and it climbs. That's really awesome, yeah. And now talking about just Worlds as an event, you know, 10 qualification matches, there's a lot that goes into it, you know, and I know you guys are trying to rank really at the top end of a very competitive division. What is some strategy advice you would give for other teams that you guys are trying to implement yourselves? Uh, well, it's, uh, you know, after finish, finishing uh, three mosaics and maybe four, uh, we just start uh, uh, just grind, jumping, grinding for the for the third set line. Yeah. Because uh, here at the World Championship, 
uh, the fifth mosaic doesn't seem such a good uh, tactic, mm -hmm. uh, at least in the qualification matches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's great advice. So AI citizens, thank you guys so much. This robot is just so well executed. I think everybody has uh, a lot to learn from it. And I'm really excited to see how you guys do for the rest of your qualification matches. Hopefully we see you make a deep run into a limbs. Uh, but thank you so much for the interview. I'm Abhas. This is First Updates Now. This is Team 19066 AI Citizens from Romania. Thank you. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Discover how Kettering University students engineer their success with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs where students earn great pay and gain valuable experience. Those accepted into Kettering University can apply for a robotic scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to Kettering.edu first to learn more and apply.